Thanks for joining us, everybody. You are tuned in to the June 2020 Power Apps Community Call. We are really excited today. We have three folks from around the community and inside Microsoft coming to share their expertise with us today. We've got news about new things in Power Apps, how to do and build cool things in Power Apps, and an example of a real world story where a Power App was built really quickly. And from what I've learned, the community had a big part to do with that too. So that's really neat and really fits our call well. Uh, so welcome to our Power Apps community call. If you haven't been on our call today, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Uh, these are your awesome hosts. That's Chuck Sterling and myself. Hi, Chuck. Uh, I'm Todd Baginski. Uh, my company is called Canvas. I'm a Microsoft MVP. I love Power Apps, Office 365, Azure, .NET, the whole Microsoft stack. Um, you can follow me on my Twitter or blog or YouTube. We've got lots of content out there about how you can learn how to do neat things with Power Apps. And Chuck, I'll let you introduce yourself as usual. Hey guys, I'm a senior program manager on the Power Apps team. I focus on the community channel. So if you've ever gone to ideas.powerapps.com or community.powerapps.com, those are my websites. And I help people, amazing people like Eric Suave and David and Reza and Todd and Sancho and all the other, well, and our presenters, of course, today. So that's me, Todd. Back to you. All right. Thanks. So. We're really happy to have you all here. And if you haven't joined the community call before, I'll quickly tell you what this is all about. We do this every month. We do it on the third Wednesday of every month. So that means our next call will be on July 15th. We always do it at the same time at 8 a.m. Pacific time. And during the call, we talk about what's new with Power Apps, what's the latest news, what are some cool community contributions people have done across the world. We meet the product teams behind Power Apps, we technical deep dive on it, and we have Q&A throughout. Today, what we're going to talk about is introduce today's team. And then we're going to talk about the Power Apps Center of Excellence. This is a related to governance with Power Apps, which I know has been a really hot topic lately. We're also going to talk about the Power Apps mobile player and then the real world example of the Power App, the school bus check in app. We're also very excited today to select the finalists for the demo extravaganza. So what this is, is a fun contest we have is second year we're having it. It's an opportunity for everyone in the world to showcase the cool things they're doing with Power Apps. So today we're going to go look at the web page and see how many votes all the contestants uh, who submitted have and select our five finalists for next month. We're also going to talk about the recent news and community activities. And then throughout the way in this call, we've got Q&A going on, and that's where all these rock stars come into play. So thank you to all these gentlemen who tune in every month here. Thomas, I think I, there's a few other people like Thomas and other folks that I need to add here too on this slide. Basically, all these folks do Power Apps just like we all do too. And they're all here every month to answer questions and help out. So if you're ever stuck with Power Apps, come here and get your question answered. Big tip of the cap to all you guys, thanks. I found a winner for our TechSmith community giveaway last month. And so I connected with Nikki this morning. It was. Turns out there's more than one Nikki Milligan in this world, and on my second attempt, I found the right one. So congratulations, Nikki. I will be sending your community giveaway from TechSmith out to you. So we'd like to thank TechSmith one more time. They were very kind and donated a license to both uh, Camtasia and Snagit, as well as a travel mug and some cool stickers. So thanks again, TechSmith. We appreciate it. Okay, that brings us to why everyone's all here today, and that's really the content. So I'd like to turn it over first to Manuela Pitchler. And Manuela, I know that you have been part of this Center of Excellence for a very long time, and I can't wait to see you talk to all of us about it. Um, so hi, I'm Manuela. I joined Microsoft in September. Before that, I was um, actually on the customer side, and I'm um, like Todd has said, I've worked on the um, Center of Excellence and the Center of Excellence Starter Kit, and um, even collaborated on on some of the solutions that are uh, that's available out there before uh, before I joined when I was on the customer side. Please find me on um, on Twitter to or on LinkedIn um, to provide um, feedback on the Center of Excellence. Really, as part of um, as part of my team, I work closely with customers, but also with the community to really 
drill down onto the governance and center of excellence needs that our customers have and um, continue to evolve um, our center of excellence starter kit. So we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by center of excellence and then do a, a demo of um, some of the components of the CUE starter kit. When we talk about a center of excellence, we really mean kind of an idea or a concept, like a unit that makes sure that the power platform strategy is aligned with the digital culture of your organization and, and has a firm place there. It doesn't have to be a 20 person department. It doesn't have to be driven by your number one champion. Um, it will start small and grow. Um, the important part here is that you have a strategic investment that the CUE drives some um, innovation and improvement and breaks down silos across your business units. So you don't end up with one business unit that's using um, the power platform and another business unit that's still buried in Excel macros and paper printouts. So having a central team in place that, that makes sure that you know, your whole organization is on the same like power platform and digital transformation path there. Um, so yeah, it's really there to like break down those silos, silos, get those business units talking to each other, learning from their success, um, sharing solutions, sharing success stories and sharing their knowledge. Establishing a CUE is really much more than, than tools. Um, it's about your processes, your people, your culture, and likely also a, a culture change where um, people are starting to, to come together to share your knowledge. Uh, once you've established the uh, why and what um, you want to uh, what, what you want to achieve with the center of excellence, the tooling can really help you with the how. Um, and that's where the CUE starter kit comes in. It's a collection of apps, flows, reports of what we've learned from our customers, um, what we've seen um, succeed in the wild, basically. It means that you don't have to start from scratch. So some of the things that you might be looking at as you as you adopt the power platform is you want to get a tenant wide overview of who your top makers are. Well, we've got you covered there. You want to identify unused applications to keep your environment tidy. Well, yeah, we've got that as well. You want to highlight applications in a company wide app catalog. Yep, got that. Some of you are going through license negotiations at the moment. You want to see who is actually using premium features, how often are they using that? Yep, there's a report for that. Um, so really what it means is that on top of the existing offering of the like admin center and the extensibility via connectors, you have a templatized implementation of best practices. That means you can get started much easier. And with that, I'd like to um, straight jump into a demo. So the CUE starter kit contains many apps, many flows, but one of the core parts is the dashboard. And that's what we see most of our customers get a lot of value um, out of. Um, so that's what I'd like to, um, to demo first and spend a bit of time um, on just because it's quite, um, there's a lot of reports in it. And, and sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming when you install it and look at it at um, it kind of in the first place. Um, so at the core, what the um, what the CUE starter kit does it it swings your tenant resources into CDS entities and then builds the Power BI dashboard on top of it. Um, we've broken the Power BI dashboard down into the monitor section that gives you the ability to um, query your inventory, so see how many environments you've got, how many apps you've got, how many makers there are. Um, it then goes into govern where you're able to perform risk assessment, so you're able to identify virally shared resources, uh, but also um, resources that aren't used anymore, or even resources that are orphaned, where the maker has maybe left the organization. Um, so you've got full visibility of that. Um, and then there's a the nurture part, so you can find your um, star app makers, your flow gurus, and you can put them to good use by making them share their success stories or supporting some of the newer makers there. I'm demoing this from my CUE development environment, so if anything goes wrong, I'll blame it on that. We've also got a thunder thunderstorm happening outside, so you know, um, it's quite a risky um, demo at the moment. Um, so once you get past the introduction, you can um, select overview, and this gives you um, an, a tenant-wide overview of everything that you've got in your tenants. You can see your environments, your makers, how many app makers and apps flow makers and flows you've got. You can see your top makers here. Um, and if you're a multinational company, you can identify hotspots of makers across, across the globe and you get the same information for flows as well. Here, so there might be like different trends here um, where um, Megan is my top app maker, but Adele and Lee are, are, are top uh, flow makers. Um, I'm Lee in that tenant, so I've got a bit of a competition going on there. And then, so that's kind of the overview. So really good to, to get an overview of what's going on in your 
in your tenant. And then you can um, see start identifying trends. And I think that's it's really important that you notice if your adoption is going if you if your adoption is going up, for example, you're hosting an internal training event, a hackathon, does that impact the adoption of the uh, of the platform overall? So you can see um, who's creating environments, what type of environments are being created. Um, you can use the rich filters within um, within Power BI to drill down into um, specific time segments or look at specific um, environments that are being created. So that's again like part of the overview. Where it gets really interesting is when you look at the um, apps information and then the flow information. Um, we're gathering all the information in your tenant, but also connecting to the audit log to get um, launch information. Um, so we know how many unique users and sessions you've got in your tenant. And um, like it's it's painting a really good picture of you of your highly used applications that might be critical and um, that might need a stronger support model around that um, or some of the success stories that you want to share. So you can again see that creation trend of applications broken down into the three types here. You can see how many are created this month, how many makers you've got, etc. And then again, you could say, OK, I've run a hackathon here and it's really improved the um, adoption of the platform. Um, you can identify through the connector to Office 365. If your AD is up to date, um, your top departments that are adopting the platform. So clearly the marketing department in this case is an early adopter of the platform. Um, they're kind of spearheading the adoption much further ahead than some of the other departments. So maybe you can reach out to them and ask them to share their success stories, organize a show and tell session um, for some of the other departments to really share what they're doing. And then you can see some of the applications that are highly used. So in my um, in my demo tenant, that's, it's not it's not that much, um, but in your tenant, that will give you really valuable information about your top applications, um, who's creating them, when they were last launched, um, how many sessions there are, um, how many unique users you've got, and the same information is available um, to to flows as well. So again, you've got the creation trend, you've got how many actions are within a flow, so you can identify complex flows, for example. You've got the flow state as well, um, so some of the flows are marked as suspended, and you've got the highlight number here as well. Flows are suspended if they violate DLP or billing restrictions, so you might have a DLP policy set up. Um, you've added that after the flow was created, um, it impacts one of the flows and suspends it, therefore. Um, the maker might not even be aware that their flow has stopped running, so this is a really good way of helping that maker reaching out to them, seeing what they're doing, and maybe migrate their flow to a different environment, or um, helping them get that flow into an active state again if it's needed, or archiving and deleting that flow if it's not needed anymore, just to keep your environments tidy. Um, so that's from an over overview point of view, you've got the same information for like for custom connectors and makers as well. And then connections, it's where it get, gets really interesting, where you want to see the connectors that are being used across your resources, across your makers. And from here, through the metadata of a connector, you can select a connector tier. So you, from here, I can see premium connectors. I can see these are my premium connectors that are being used across my resources. These are the makers that are using them. Um, and for your kind of license planning, like especially premium license planning, that is really helpful to know um, who those makers are, who those departments are, and who those resources are that are using uh, premium functionality. Obviously, quite high in my demo tenant. Um, if that's not kind of still not enough information for you, you can drill down even further um, and say, actually, I just want to see who's using the Azure, like one of the Azure connectors. I'm trying to find one that I know we're using. Let's see, common data service there. So again, I, like I've drilled down further um, to see, well, I've got 50 uh, applications, but 600 flows that are using the common data service. Maybe not all of them are needed anymore. Uh, maybe I can archive some of them and I can again look at um, some of the creation dates there. So from a kind of administration point of view, having visibility of what's going on in your tenant is one of the most important parts to be able to adopt it and to govern it because you can't govern what you can't see. So having that full visibility is, is really helpful and that's um, part of why we've got that deep dive available within the dashboard here. Um, but then we, we're kind of taking it one step uh, further based on some of the customer um, feedback that we got. And we've now got app and flow um, risk assessments and that really I think what's a risk to your company is like is very um, subjective. Um, so we've included a couple of filters here, but we are providing you with the Power BI dashboard file, so you can really like change that to whatever you can uh, you perceive as a risk. Um, one of the risks might be if an application is shared with everyone in the tenant. So I can easily identify that here. I can see I've got two applications shared with the entire tenant. App catalog, probably fair. Everyone needs access to that. 
This PowerX template, not sure what that is. I don't think that needs to be shared with the entire organization. So I can reach out to Lee and um, ask Lee to maybe unshare that or reconsider who that application is shared with. Um, they might have accidentally shared it with everyone. Another risk is applications that are shared with a high number of individual users. Um, where it's easy for a maker to lose oversight of who the application is actually shared with. And then some of those users might um, change departments and not need the application anymore. Um, so it's also like part of an admin's role is the ability to reach out to the maker and say, hey, I can create an Azure Active Directory group for you. Um, you can share the application with that group. We'll establish a movers and levers, a join us process for um, the departments or job roles that need that application. And then that weight is often the um, maker to to manage all of um, all of that um, as well. Um, so some of those tasks can be performed for um, apps and flows as well. And similarly, something that you and um, probably the yeah one of the last demos I do is um, the archive. So applications that are unused but still shared will clog up your environment. They'll um, show up in the Parx mobile player. Um, so users might be confused about why they're still seeing applications even so they've not used them for months. Um, so if you've introduced an archive score and um, the score is based on when the application was last launched, but also on, on indicators like, um, is it using a, a word like test or demo in the title? Is it likely a template? Um, has it not been modified since it was created? Um, so we've sorted the, that screen here by the highest archive score. And uh, you could um, go into those applications and delete them from the environment or like at least unshare them. Uh, so only the maker has access to them to make sure that your um, end users have a really tidy and clean experience of your application. Uh, of your of the power platform um, estate. Um, so those are kind of some of like key criteria that we've got as part of that overview. And then in terms of kind of nurture, it's also really important for you to identify your um, your top makers and what they're using because your champions, um, like in some cases we've seen with um, Schlumberger and um, the digital um, agents that he's got is um, those those champions can really transform the entire organization and pave the way for um, for other um, for other users. So here I can see that um, Megan is using quite a lot of connectors. I can see what connectors they're using. If I then select, for example, um, Alex, um, I can see they're uh, probably a, a traditional developer because um, they're using Logic Flow, CDS, HTTP. Um, if I select um, Johnny here, um, they're using mainly Office connectors. So maybe Johnny and Megan can like learn from each other. Maybe Megan has a trick or two to teach um, Johnny. And that dashboard helps me enable that conversation between the makers um, there so I can guide them in the right way. Um, so the dashboard is a really um, small part of the um, starter kit, there's many more assets to it, but um, some of the, um, it's kind of the heart, of, uh, the heart of it and what we see most of our customers um, adopt. I'd like to pause here for a second. I think I'm also out of time, but are there any questions? We had a couple questions regarding yeah. if you don't want to use CDS, what mm -hmm. are your options? A couple people chimed in and said, hey, you can use SharePoint as a data source. With the standard license, Reza mentioned that. I know that other folks in the industry, I know some folks who've converted it to use SQL, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we ship it uh, as a solution with um, CDS just because that's the simplest way for us to ship it. Um, if you use it, if you're interested in only the dashboard, actually only the admin persona needs a needs a premium license. So it's only uh, potentially like one or one or two people that are your power platform admins that need to that need that license. Um, so it's uh, from that point of view, it's not maybe not as massive an investment as getting it for your whole um, organization just to get started. Um, the dashboard will provide you with the tenant wide overview. Um, yeah, and then we have like some partners that have ported it to SharePoint, um, for example, as well. So yeah, um, it's not, I think what we're looking at like some of the wider shared components, we've got it on our roadmap to make them easier accessible with um, with standard licenses. Um, but the, for the admin components, um, we will like continue to rely on um, on CDS there. That's great. I, this one doesn't come from the audience. My question was more about what do you see is like the first thing that people do in a large org after they install this and they discover the sprawl that has occurred? Like, what is the very first step you like to get going with? 
Yeah, so um, this is a horrible slide, so I didn't have time to format that better. So the first thing we recommend is getting um, getting familiar with the documentation. Um, we've recently moved it to docs.microsoft.com um, and really invested a lot into the what's part of the CV starter kit and how to use its sections. And we're also recording videos at the moment um, to make that easier um, to, to get started so you can view the video. And then like spend a lot of time getting familiar with the admin components and the dashboard and really think about the processes, like think about your risk assessments, think about what you want to archive and then plan your data loss prevention um, policy. If you don't already have DLP policies um, set up, that's vital um, to ensure um, administration and governance, that's vital to protect your data. And then use the DLP editor that I didn't demo to mitigate the risk of a DLP policy negatively affecting um, the resources. And then um, if you've already got organic adoption and viral adoption through the Office 365 um, seeded license, look at your orphan resources and assign them new owners. So orphan resources are where the maker has left the organization. Um, so they're showing um, they're still like apps are still usable. Um, so uh, end users can still use those applications, but obviously there's no one there to maintain them. There's no owner there. So ensure that they have new owners assigned, maybe from their um, from their department, etc. And then also identify unused resources that are just clogging up your environment. So the 500 device um, ordering um, applications that are um, in your default environment um, that makers might have shared with their department because they were really proud of their of their application. And now if you look at the mobile application, you have to scroll through all of those device ordering apps um, to get to the app that you're actually looking for. And then the, the second, um, so the point five and six on um, planning a governance strategy and embracing the maker community, we see um, usually happen hand in hand. Um, so it's typically a change management team, a business change team that um, looks after kind of the nurture strategy. So uh, onboarding new makers, organizing internal events, um, doing show and tell sessions, and then the admin team that's looking at um, a process as to like what to do with non-compliant applications, what audits do I want to run, what risk assessments do I want to do. Um, so that's typically the lot of time spent here and then these kind of follow. Yeah, that makes sense. What what is your typical experience been and what you've seen with customers on when they start with nothing and now they're <laughs> at the point where they've got it installed and they've <laughs> gone through all these steps and it's just moving along. Um, what's the start to finish time on that typically that you're seeing? Is it is it a month, a week? Um, so it's uh, don't install a series starter kit just to um, check a box. Um, it's not a tick box exercise. It's a living and breathing um, piece. So the dashboard you would um, some of our administrators use um, daily or at least weekly to get more insights into their adoption. Um, some of the like audit pieces or nurture pieces again um, are quite like frequently used. Um, and then a lot of our administrators also um, extend the series starter kit to fit their needs. So they put in um, like a license request model uh, or an environment request model based on kind of some of the entities that we've got. Um, so I can't, like installing it, you can do in an hour. Getting familiar with it, you can do in a week, but it's not, yeah, don't do not do it to just um, tick a box. It, it really is driven by your by your digital transformation. So it's something that you should use and really embed in your processes and, and make use of um, for, for a long time. That makes sense. It reminds me a whole lot of getting a hold on uh, SharePoint governance and uh, SharePoint forms mm. across an org, how you attack that. Do you also see the similarity between this and how a, a, an org that is properly governing SharePoint will assign at least a part-time or a full-time resource to do this? We've, funnily enough, the, the, with some of our organizations that are also heavily adopting SharePoint, um, they've, they're working with partners to extend the dashboard to also show them SharePoint information because um, the, the organization saw the, the series starter kit dashboard and they loved the overview it gave them and they've asked the partner to um, put the same information in place for their SharePoint and Teams adoption so they get a bigger picture of, of what's going on. So, but yeah, I think it, it does, yeah, it's it's in line with kind of a dedicated resource looking after that. And um, there's many roles in that. So like the nurture part can definitely be driven by champions, but like the DLP strategy has to come from your um, administra um, administrators. 
That's great. I, there's a lot of people on the call giving big time kudos to the COE here who've already tried it. And I see several people are excited to try that out themselves too. Really awesome. nice. Look forward to seeing how you continue to evolve this because since you've joined Microsoft, this has evolved so much in just the past, what was that about November? You joined, if I recall, yes. right before night. Yeah. yeah. My yeah. gosh, yeah. that's just nine months, and this thing's grown by leaps and bounds. So yeah, we're Thanks. running it like a uh, yeah, we're running it like a product now. So we've got a DevOps um, pipeline, um, DevOps board um, to manage our work items and backlog, and we're planning on like writing up um, some of the best practices that we found out in developing the CUE kit on how to manage like Power Platform proje uh, projects. Um, across multiple environments, like across the dev test and prod environment with an uh, application lifecycle management um, process. So yeah, um, it helps us a lot in providing feedback to the product team as well on, on some of that um, some of that process. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the feedback. I'll I see some of the questions in the chat window, so I'll, um, I'll answer that in the Teams chat. Sounds good. Thanks for joining today. I know you have to scoot off to another presentation here too. So uh, have a great day. No, man. thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. I hope it was valuable. You're welcome. All right, let's change gears here now and move over to what Larry's going to talk to us about, the Power Apps mobile player. Larry, how are you doing today? I'm very good, thanks, Todd. Good. Uh, shall I just jump in? Yeah, go for it. Great. So, hello, everybody. My name is Larry Nib. I'm a program manager in the PowerApps mobile team. So, you've probably heard from uh, Kavishi in previous community calls. Kavishi's still in the team, but I've taken over from her as the program manager for the PowerApps mobile app for iOS and Android. So, I'll be joining these calls from now on. Uh, this is my first call, so I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm not quite sure how these normally go, so I've got a few slides with a bit of content in, and I'm guessing there'll be some questions generated out of that. So please just go ahead and shoot the questions in the chat as soon as you uh, think of them. So all of my slides today, I have three slides and a, a video demo at the end. Uh, they're all on a common theme. Uh, you probably saw recently that we released a version of the PowerApps player that can support model apps. So this is the topic for the first slide. Uh, we previewed that in March, and then we released that for general availability uh, end of April. So just just managing to sneak it into our April release window. The 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 thing you'll see here actually it's not visible in the screenshot, but you'll see it later in the in the demo video. So model driven apps or UCI app framework apps from the Dynamics 365 uh, world, when those show up in the in the Power Apps mobile app app list, you'll see that they have a jigsaw icon. So that's the that's the way to differentiate which of your apps are Canvas Power Apps and which are model driven apps. Uh, this one here has actually a, a custom icon. That support isn't quite there yet, but it's coming. So with the addition of uh, model driven apps to the Power Apps mobile app, uh, you can find those in the apps list, same as before. All of the usual apps list uh, features work for model driven apps as well. So you can uh, search, you can sort, uh, and you can pin to home. So the pin to home functionality, you can also use that with the, the model-driven apps. Love that functionality. That's almost always one of the first things new folks who are new to Power Apps ask, how do I get to this quicker? Yeah. So actually, the Power Apps mobile app will sort. It has an option to sort your most recently used apps to the top of the app list anyway. So if you are using multiple apps regularly, you can still use the Power Apps um, mobile app app list to get to your apps and switch between them. Uh, if you're only using one or two, pinning to home is a good way to, to open those uh, quickly because you can launch it directly from your home screen. That works really well on Android. iOS, not so much. We have to use a, a small trick to make it happen on iOS. Uh, it, it actually broke in the latest uh, iOS 13.5 beta. So we had a bit of a panic moment to, to go around the loop with Apple to see if it was a bug or if they'd actually <laughs> removed the support for the feature. Uh, in fact, it was a bug and they fixed it. So we're, we're good again. I see a okay, question I'll... already for you, Larry. This one comes from Jamie. It's, uh, do we need to do anything to get a model-driven app to appear in the mobile player and reverse? Is there a way to publish uh, model-driven apps so it's not available on the player? 
Yeah, good question. So you don't need to do anything special to get it to appear in the mobile player. Uh, there are a few model-driven apps that don't appear in the in the PowerApps player. Uh, that's by design because we have different surfaces which are the primary uh, mobile app surfaces that those model-driven apps should appear in. But those are primarily first-party model-driven apps. So I don't think that's going to affect you. In terms of preventing something showing up in the uh, player, we don't have that mechanism yet. There is going to be a targeting mechanism uh, that that will come, and that's because we have a number of mobile apps now where model-driven apps can be surfaced, and, and we're aware that customers will want to decide which of those uh, it should be where their apps show up. So that's that's on the roadmap. It's it's not available just yet, but it's coming. Okay, uh, no more questions on that one. So let's move on. Uh, mobile optimized UX for model apps. So again, on the model apps theme. Actually, my background is I came over from the Dynamics 365 uh, mobile team. So I was working on the Dynamics 365 for phones app before this, and then and then I moved across to work on the Power Apps mobile app. So I've I've sort of transitioned across just as uh, model app playback has transitioned across from Dynamics 365 into the Power Apps player. Uh, in this case, we've been building, uh, and and with large thanks to uh, Shahari, who may or may not be on the call, uh, he was leading this effort. So we um, have been doing a lot of UX refresh work on the on the UCI app framework, specifically for the mobile context, because the the UX it wasn't particularly aligned with the mobile platforms that it was running on. So when you run uh, the UCI app framework on or model-driven apps on mobile, it would help users feel um, the, the experience is more streamlined if the, if the app framework adapted its uh, presentation to the platform that it's on. So for Android and iOS, you have different patterns for things like button locations, button styles, uh, control styles, um, checkboxes, toggles, even the way that the even the way that the menus slide in and out, or the um, you, you know the 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 Chrome on the on the window, the way that it's styled is very platform specific. So what we've done is we've actually spent quite a bit of time help, uh, helping the the UCI app framework, so the model driven app framework, to render itself. In a, in a sensitive way on the mobile platform so that it gives a more integrated and streamlined experience. That's the, outstanding. Yeah, so that's the, the, the GA, that's now in GA. Uh, and the second half is year, I, I forgot this was on the slide. Um, it's real time tracking and push notifications. So uh, this allows, uh, the real time tracking is specifically with um, uh, GPS. So this will enable uh, apps model-driven apps that want to track on a, on a frequent basis the location of the device. And there are valid scenarios for this um, in, the, in a business context particularly. Um, and then push notifications to allow um, custom notifications to be sent to the, to the app while it's running. Very handy. I know a lot of use cases about the push notifications that pop up. OK. This is going to get a lot of questions, I know. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Very good. Um, so offline, uh, offline in the in the Canvas world is uh, save data, load data. Offline in the uh, model-driven world, so this is more of a managed experience. Uh, it's it's getting better all the time. Um, we've been improving the reliability a lot. Uh, we've we've been fixing a lot of bugs. Uh, so it's it's getting better. Um, and the, the news now, which isn't on the slide because it wasn't updated, I think. Um, so the, we are just going into preview for supporting um, model-driven mobile offline with uh, CDS-only orgs. So this is for customers who don't use a Dynamics license. They're using a, a CDS license or a Power Apps license with CDS, and they're able to get um, mobile offline in their model-driven apps whether where those apps are hosted in CDS-only orgs. So this is, this, is a, this is a preview that we're starting. 
there's a link down in the bottom right hand corner of this slide. Uh, if you click on that link, that'll take you to a sign up form where you can sign up for the preview and then you can get in on the action. Here it is. So there's just a there's just a few questions and that will drop into my inbox along with a few other people and then we'll we'll reach out to you to onboard you to the preview. Awesome. Uh, so we are, and we continue to work on um, offline uh, features uh, to improve it, and this is in progress just now. In in October, so it says age two, 2020 here, but you know we're aligned to April and October boundaries, so it'll be roughly around the October timeframe. Uh, we're looking for bulk user ads for mobile offline uh, profile management. So this is part of the admin experience. This is an improvement uh, people asked for. Um, it, it was that you had to manage your users individually, and that was painful, of course. So we're adding support for managing uh, multiple users at a time. Business logic, there's, okay, so there's a big um, middle tier effort going on, which will improve the, the ability of the platform to run business logic while offline, including things like validation, which is important so that when you go back online, it doesn't immediately fail to sync because it fails a simple validation and then you're in a stuck state where you have all this data that's stuck behind a, a validation that's failing. So business logic running on the device while offline, that's coming. Um, and then and so this is under this moniker of uh, offline by default. So it's more of a design principle that the framework should be designed in such a way that um, it considers itself to be offline unless it happens to have a connection, in which case it can then do online. Um, behaviors. So uh, it's a it's a kind of reversal of the way that we think about designing the app uh, framework so that it's resilient to being offline rather than offline being an afterthought. So Larry, that makes me think when you're taking the paradigm like offline be by default here, like you talked about that, the amount of code or configuration that someone's going to need to do in order to make it offline is really small. Am I guessing right on that? That's right. Yeah, it shouldn't be. It should be a platform feature. Like offline, offline is is a, is a state or a scenario that you can be in, and your use cases should continue to work in that state or a scenario, and you shouldn't have to write extra code to make that happen. So it's important that we adapt the platform to support that by default. And then, and then the maker doesn't need to expend the effort like programming for that case. That makes sense. I see a, a couple big hearts here. People all caps really yeah. stoked about this. There's a question from Uday about storage limits for mobile offline. Yeah. Uh, Canvas has 30 to 70 meg. Uh, okay, so I think the recommendation is between 30 and 70 meg for offline storage. But I'm, it's, it depends on your your portfolio of devices in use at your company. So if you have larger storage available, there's there's no practical limit except what's what's on the device, and and what the operating system will give to the apps if you're using some kind of MAM solution. Um, so it's up to you. Um, I think the the recommendation is carefully crafted at like 30 to 70 meg because. Um, that's a good average ballpark for all the devices out there. It's not necessarily specific to your organization. And how are records synced via HTTPS? <laughs> I'm not sure what's the, I didn't quite catch the question. In general, so the, so the actual underlying technology is, uh, so, the, so the mobile app is using, it's, it's provisioning a SQLite database to store data where the CRUD operations have happened offline. Uh, and and so there's a there's a there's a, a journal effectively of changes that have happened in the in the device and then when the uh, connectivity is restored then it will detect that and immediately propagate the uh, the changes back up to the server. Gotcha. So I imagine underneath the hood you're doing all those things like did this record get updated since I updated it offline? Who wins, etc. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, okay, here's a short demo video. Uh, this is a, a little homage to Kabishi. No, you put a video in there. Yeah, there you go. So this is this is tying everything together. That was the offline status page. So this was uh, going into offline mode. 
this allows you to see some of the new uh, model driven uh, app UI specific to the there's the new calendar picker looks like a looks like a native calendar uh, these are this is styled for iPhones so you'll see at the top of the screen here there was a save and discard buttons in in blue text uh, so this is very um, iOS style uh, it's all wrapped in the the iOS frame with the notch Okay, so this is this is some of the uh, the mobile optimized UX. So you see, it's uh, I don't know how familiar everybody is if if this is mostly a canvas style call or if it's uh, if they're a mobile driven app uh, developers here as well. But you you should be seeing some new UX uh, patterns that that maybe you haven't seen before. This is an inline uh, camera signing. Anyway, uh, the, the 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 demo is to show the um, mobile UX, uh, mobile style UX that we've added for the for the model driven apps. Awesome. So that's all I have. Um, any any other questions? Yeah. So, how about the field service and sales mobile apps? You know, I think I heard a rumor that those are built on top of the Power Apps mobile app. Is that really is that the case? Yeah, in fact, that's exactly oh. right. So, so this effort to, if you think about it, we had the, the Power Apps app, the Power Apps player, uh, we had the Dynamics 365 player, we had mm -hmm. Canvas over here, we had Model over here. What we've done is we've actually taken the Model playback capability from the Dynamics player, put it into the Power Apps player, and now the Power Apps player can play both Model and Canvas. This is part of our convergence story for uh, bringing together the two app platforms. So now you have a player base that can play both model and canvas. And what we're doing is we're actually launching, and we, we did in fact launch in April, uh, or 1st of May, I think it was, but who's counting, um, the field service, um, field service mobile app, which is actually built on top of the, in fact, that one was built on top of the Dynamics 365 player, because at the time that was the one that was ready and able to build and able to um, to run model-driven apps. But what, mm -hmm. since we've moved across the model playback capability to the Parrots player, we are just about to, and I think it's happening next week, in fact, we're mm -hmm. about to uh, switch out the uh, Dynamics-based field service app with the Parrots-based field service app. So take a, take a look at that. If you're a field service user and you're using the field service uh, Dynamics 365 app from the App Store, uh, keep an eye on it next week because we are going to switch out the, the app platform underneath. And all of these changes that we've been making, so the so the ability for the player to play model-driven apps, the, the improved UX on mobile, and even the improved offline on mobile, that's all designed to create an app platform that allows what we call the standalone apps to be built. So we have the, the field service uh, mobile app upcoming is a sales mobile app, so a sales-specific mobile app um, for Dynamics 365, also built on the Parrots mobile player. Uh, in fact, previews are starting for this uh, fairly soon. So if you're interested, uh, and if you have a contact with uh, Shuhari or Egal, then feel free to reach out to them directly. If you don't, reach out to me, uh, and I'll put you in touch if you're interested to participate in the sales preview. But yes, we are now we're now officially an app platform with also the player, not just the app web app platforms, but the player is an app platform as well. That's awesome. End to end coverage across all those different technologies in one player. Yes. Makes it very easy for the end user too, right? You don't need to need to open up two or three different apps just to bounce exactly. around and do your job. Exactly. And I think if we if we uh, combine this with um, Manuela's point earlier about the archive score, I, I love the idea of the archive score in the COE uh, dashboard. I think we should put that into the Power Apps app uh, so you can sort your app list by archive score. <laughs> I think that would work especially well inside Microsoft because there's so many uh, so many items that are in the list uh, that, that maybe are old or have demo in the name. That would be yeah, a, like, gosh, good my development environment could use that all by itself. I'm sure everybody on the call feels the same way. Yeah, you once you get like three, four dozen apps in there, it's like, oh boy, <laughs> how am I going to find it? That's yeah, great. we got a plus one, plus one on the on the chat. So 
There you go. I'll, I'll, I'll have the work next for that. I'm in the backlog, right? <laughs> awesome. Any other questions? Yeah, there's uh, one there from Adam. Uh, uh, off topic, apparently, uh, that the mobile apps can be placed in Teams Mobile. Any update on this? Well, yes. So uh, Teams, Teams has a mobile app, and the and Teams itself can embed Power Apps, and the Teams mobile app also supports those embedded Power Apps. Uh, I think the the support for uh, things like access to device capabilities on mobile that's that's still in development, um, but there is there is generally support for Power Apps in Teams. Uh, and that, that that extends to mobile as well. So yes, that is supported. Awesome, great. Th thanks for coming by here today, Larry. We appreciate yeah, it. Look forward me. to seeing how this develops, especially with that mobile. I, I already know one power app I'm working on right now that's actually going to benefit from that really great as soon as that's available. So I'm going to be signing up myself. <laughs> Sure. Uh, there's one more one more question. If you want to reach me, my my email is lnib at microsoft.com. So Perfect. that's how to reach me. And I wanted to leave you with a teaser as well for next time, or maybe for a couple of times in the future. Uh, I'm not going to say any more about it except dark mode. Gotcha. That sounds good. We'll see. Uh... I'm, I'm, yeah, I knew the chat was going to light up with that one. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thanks, Sigma. Well, maybe we can have you back on when that happens. Then I'm sure you'll have some other updates to share at that point in time as well. There, I just, I'll, I'll, keep answering, I'll keep answering questions in the chat. Sounds good. Thanks, Todd. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everyone. You're welcome. All right. So, the next one is now we'd like to welcome Lauren to the call. Lauren, thanks for being here today, too. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me here today, actually. You're welcome. Uh, so we've we've done a lot of uh, tools and what's new in Power Apps. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about a real world thing that you worked on and built. And I can't wait to see all the, the details on this. I'll let you take it away here. Well, I think it's interesting that you you say that I built it because I, this is one of my favorite apps that I've been a part of. You know, I've built quite a few for my school. Um, I'm an assistant principal in Tacoma, Washington. So I built quite a few apps for my school just in terms of running things more efficiently. Anyone who works with an educator or knows an educator, I mean, education is just busy, point blank, period. And um so being an administrator is just is definitely busy. So what we were doing, um, we're, well, really where this this school bus app um, came from, well, came from the community. But there was just, uh, I would say, the setup for the problem that we were having was that students often ended up on the getting on the wrong bus after school. This always happens a lot at the beginning of the school year. And then as the school year goes on, it happens a little bit less. But, you know, a bunch of kids come out of the building. We have over 500 students. There's, you know, four or five buses out in the front and kids just get on the bus. They don't even always pay attention. And if the buses don't park in the same order for whatever reason, then it's even worse. So I knew that that was a problem. And especially for me, because, you know, I'd be packing up at the end of the day, getting ready to go. And then a bus would just show up at five o'clock and say, hey, this student was on the wrong bus. And so now we're bringing them back to school. So then it's on me to kind of figure out where this child is supposed to go and be or parents would call the school and say you know my child didn't get off on the right stop so then we would have to call the transportation department and then transportation would then call dispatch and dispatch would call the bus and say okay is this kid here i mean so you can imagine at that point you know a parent is just they've been waiting at the bus stop now for <laughs> and don't know where their child is so it takes it takes quite a long time just to do all of that and then as a result, really, of all of that, a student ends up on a bus for hours until they're returned back to the school or to the correct stop or whatever it is. And oftentimes, you know, if a student is riding a school bus, a parent doesn't necessarily have transportation to get up to the school to come and pick them up. So then we have to figure out how to get that child home. So that was just a big problem. I was like, OK, there's definitely 
a way that I can streamline this process. And I knew that an app was a way to do it. I just didn't really have the time. So the intermediate solution really was we ended up with clipboards and printed out lists, you know, blue bus, red bus, green bus. This is who rides this bus. And, you know, standing outside, you wait outside um, and you just check off student names one by one on this list. And you have upwards sometimes of 50, 60 kids on a bus. And then students would get checked in. But then the problem with that was, one, um, it was a paper list. And our buses can update, you know, the same bus can update maybe four or five times, you know, in a week. Uh, so if a student moved uh, buses or a student was added to the bus or removed from the list, then we always had to constantly reprint that. And then uh, the clipboards, I mean, a clipboard <laughs> is a coveted item in an elementary school. So if there's a clipboard laying around, it's like, oh, I don't think anybody's using it for this. So then they take the, whatever papers off and go and do whatever they want to do with the clipboard. So that was also another issue. And then the biggest issue was that the bus, our bus loading area where we load students on the bus, that's not a covered area. And we live in Washington. So the majority of the fall, it's raining. And so you have people standing outside with clipboards and papers and what's your name and checking them off. And it was just a mess. It was, it helped, but it was a big mess. <laughs> and so, I just put it out to the community. I posted on Twitter, I hashtagged the power addicts and power apps, and I just asked, hey, this is kind of a hack for good scenario. And I know it's not a hack for good time, but if you can help with this, this is the situation and you know who can help me build it. And this is just uh, one screenshot of just some of the immediate Twitter responses that I got from that of people who just wanted to help either provide solution or you know hands on build the app. And I was blown away because I just thought, oh, a couple of people might offer me some advice, but I ended up having a group of people who really wanted to build it. And, you know, shout out to Eric Save. I think he's on this call. Um, he really helped to spearhead that and took it and um, created a WhatsApp group. And um, everybody in that group, they worked really behind the scenes. I didn't do anything on this app. You know, I felt bad because in this WhatsApp group, I'm getting all these updates and people are saying, hey, what about this? What do you think about this? I tried this. Do you want a demo? And I really didn't have time to join in, you know, on any of that because I was, you know, I was doing my job. So I'm just really grateful to the community for doing that. But anyway, so they, um, they built it. They said, hey, Lauren, here it is. Can we get on a call with you and just kind of show you the back end of it? Make sure when we hand it off that you understand what's going on. And of course, I made the time for that. And I mean, I think that this took, I want to say like a month maybe. <laughs> and this, these are people doing this in their spare time, you know, everybody else, you know, is working and whatnot. So it may be about a month. And then it took a little bit of time for us to adopt it in terms of getting everybody trained on it. But then here we are, you know, this is my family liaison. She's checking students in on the bus on, on her, this is on her personal device on her phone. So I didn't have to buy any extra devices to make this happen. There's no more paper lists. And it was really quick and easy. You know, we're able to check the kids in. Behind the app runs a flow where, you know, it's cleared every night because we don't need to store store that data. And I mean, the response, we have a, a four or five teachers who stand outside the bus and check kids in. The response was really positive in terms of not having to look for your list and reprint and all of that. It's just in your pocket. So you just run out and you just go check kids in uh, on the bus. I'm curious, Lauren, so how many kids have got on the wrong bus since you had the app? Is it zero? Oh, I haven't. I have not. This is this was the first year. I mean, granted, we had to end early because of COVID, but this was the first year since I started that once we implemented this, it was done. I didn't That's awesome. bus did not come back. <laughs> there wasn't that dreaded five o'clock bus where I had my bag getting ready to leave and go, oh, here's a bus. It didn't happen again. It was easy. So I'll show you some of the features that really help to make that a bigger, um, an even bigger success. So um, we have, you know, three buses, blue bus, red bus, and green bus. And um, what it does on the back end is the user, their name actually populates right here automatically. And then you just decide which bus you're checking in. 
And then I just added some fake students here. Usually we have about 50, 60 kids, you know, on the list here. And then all that the person has to do is scroll through and they just check that the student, like, okay, one of three students is on the bus. So what that also helps with is knowing, okay, is everyone on the bus, first of all, before the bus even leaves. The other piece that was really helpful, um, this was another point of confusion, was, you know, okay, this student doesn't ride the bus on Friday. And those types of things are important because, well, one, I, in one scenario, it was really helpful because we actually had a pair of twins who, they didn't go to the same place after school and they flipped and rotated which days. Like one twin would go home with, and then one twin would go to the boys and girls club and then they might flip flop. And mom had this worked out for a very specific reason. And they always tried, no, we go here, we go here. I want to go with my friend. And they'd pull up that note and say, no, this is the day, this today is Tuesday and you're supposed to go here. So that was really helpful. I mean, so you can imagine with all of those, you know, every, you know, over 500 kids, every different little nuance in terms of how they go home and when they go home and where, it really cut down on all of that. And so, I mean, you can, search for a student, you can search by student name, you can search by bus or teacher. So all of that was really helpful for us in terms of just being able to get the kids on the right bus uh, at the right time. And like I say, it's my favorite app because it was built by the community. You know, it wasn't something that I, I, I mean, yeah, Power Apps has really helped me because I'm not a developer and I, you know, don't know how you don't know how to just build an app, but this was something that I just put out and said, Hey, you know, can you help me with this? And in a month I had what I needed and no extra expense to uh, the school or um, a ton of training or onboarding for anyone. So, but yeah, that was quick, quick overview, but yeah, that's pretty much how, how we came to be. Yeah. That's awesome. What a great story. I'm glad Eric is here today, too, in the call. And Eric and everybody who worked on that. I noticed in the, the screenshot of Twitter you had that there were several people on that list who've actually been on, on this call before sharing their <laughs> stuff, too. That That's is awesome. really neat. And the best part is the kids are getting on the right bus now. Yes. And nobody's worried. And that's super. And I get to get home on time. <laughs> so, awesome. definitely. Oh, Chuck's got a story. Oh, Chuck's gone through it firsthand, huh, Chuck? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, that hasn't happened to my little guy yet. Yeah. But yeah. I can totally identify with what that feeling must be like just thinking about it, like, oh, my gosh. Right. So what is uh, where do you all store the data for that? How did you do that one? Um, on the back end, we used SharePoint uh, okay. just to update our list. And what's also really nice is... We have um, the app embedded in Teams, and we also have, I also have our SharePoint list embedded as a top tab in Teams because we have, um, you know, a, a couple of our paraeducators who really, mo you know, either monitor the app in terms of who's getting on the bus or, you know, like if a parent calls, did my child get on, they, they can see, yes, that child is checked in or um, adding students, because like I said, it's pretty fluid, could just depend. And so it's really just the ease of use and you know, minimal requirement of training in terms of being able to update it is really helpful. Yeah. That's great, that's <laughs> great. So is, was, I'm curious, is the red, the green, and the blue bus, is that just for the demo? Because I see all the pictures, the, the bus is yellow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, okay, that, that, that's hilarious because um, so, each bus, you know, has a number, but for elementary, we assign it a color because that's a little bit easier. And we had a kindergartner, uh, the very first day he was on the bus, he rode the bus, he comes out and he goes, no, I ride the red bus. There's no red <laughs> bus, they're all yellow. And we're like, no, it's just called the red bus, honey. <laughs> he was not going to get on the bus. <laughs> Having got on the wrong bus one time myself as a kid, I can identify with that thing, <laughs> the kids on the bus forever. Yeah. Yeah. I did that as well. I rode probably mm -hmm. around half of Tacoma and then was finally returned to my parents when I was in like third grade, I think. <laughs> That's really neat. So I'm I'm curious, since the app was community developed, is this app out in the gallery or anything for other institutions to use if they want to? 
it's interesting because I thought about that last night. I go, oh, I should upload, you know, <laughs> it to the community. It was such a, um, or I think, I think maybe Eric might have, I'm not sure. It was just such a, hey, I need it. I need to use it type of situation. I didn't think about that. But if yeah. Eric hasn't uploaded it, I definitely will. That's really awesome. I so somebody mentioned they already thought of somebody. Oh yeah, Richard said he says at least one school transportation supervisor would love this. So awesome. That is cool. Yeah. yeah. This is this is one of a oh boy. I think we've been doing this call for like I, I don't know. I think this is like the 18th, 19th time we've done this call now or something. And this is the first time we've had a story like this where we showcase yeah. something everybody in the community worked on. It's really yeah. neat to see. I hope we can have more of these stories on the call in yeah. the future. Well, yeah, thank yeah. you for coming and sharing it with us. It's really yeah. neat to see that. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Okay. What a great demo there. So to wrap up our call here today, a few things, the, the resources, uh, that first link is actually about Lauren's story right there, if you want to learn more about that. And there's also other people focused in that link too, that it talks about uh, who built apps, who didn't come from a dev background. Um, and then that mobile offline support preview uh, that Larry talked about, I took his link and put it on this page to help make that a little more obvious as well. Okay, so recent news, the demo extravaganza. So it's time to find out who are our five finalists going to be here today. So let me flip over to that web page. And we're going to count them up. So whoever our top five vote getters are here today at this point are jumping into the demo extravaganza next week. Let's see what our top five are. We've got the this one, 20, 19, 18, 19, 60. Oh, looks like there's a tie for fifth place here. So we have the 3D Pokemon, Pokemon Mixed Reality app here by Michelle. We've got the Reduced Capacity Office Reservation System by Matt. Matt and I actually work together. Um, we also have here Deepak has created the Kids Learning Power app. Matt, he's been on showing one of his apps before. He's got the Pipe Dream app, so that's top four. And then it looks like we have a tie here with the YouTube using Power Apps and the Astronaut 3D Explorer. Todd, this is Reza. Hey, how you doing? Hey, doing good. So uh, I already see a 3D app, which is Michelle's app, which is way better than mine. So I think uh, let's give let's let's put Renato through, and uh, we we have our top five there. Oh, that was very gracious of you. You're awesome. such a super Reza. There you go. Yeah. Well, yeah. Reza is the champion last year, so now you get to enjoy and just sit back and relax next month and watch everybody else, I suppose. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'll vote for the best guy. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. So besides those five that we're going to see next month, you know, if everybody, I encourage you, I, I took a look at every single one of these myself and read all about them. And I see some really neat things in here. Uh, this one was really intriguing to me, actually, because it, it talks about a lot of things in Power Apps and Power Platform that aren't just Power Apps. And there's many more. So I think I may even be reaching out to some of these other folks here as well, to see if they'd like to come on the call and show their app off after the demo extravaganza. So that, that seems to me like the right thing to do. Right, mine's awesome. simple. Like, I was going to recommend the same thing, Todd, because I'm I like, I think there's so many fascinating apps that people are putting together. I really would love for others to demo as well. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So next month, I will be reaching out to all five of these folks and getting everybody the details, and we will be watching five cool demos of five really neat Power Apps solutions next month. So then next month, what we're going to do is during the call, we will all vote during the call and we will pick the winner during the call next month as well. Okay, recent news and cool stuff with Power Apps. 
Actually, Deepak, one of the folks here in the final, made this first one power mega navigation component. So think mega menu for like a website, for example, and think, hey, I need a mega menu in my power app. Well, he, may, he built a component to do that. I encourage you to check that one out. The second one, this thing called Introduction, Planning a Power Apps Project. I don't know if anybody's seen this. It just got released the other day onto the internet. Uh, but essentially what it is is some documentation that really says, hey, here's how you go from beginning to end and pow plan out how you go about building a Power App and a project with Power Apps technology. Uh, so especially for those of you who are new to it or even new to software development, I really encourage you to check out that link. The next one is a contest. It's the hashtag MSFT Power Break. And if you click that link, you can go learn more about it. If my memory serves me right, it starts next week. It's either the 22nd or the 26th, I think I saw on that blog post. But you can learn all about it and win fabulous prizes for tweeting about and answering questions about Power Apps. So take that uh, look at that. That's a lot of fun community things, too. Uh, the next one is there have been some updates to the notify timeout and the exit sign out functions. And in this blog post, you'll learn about those formulas and what's been enhanced there. I'm sure that everyone on this call is going to find useful at least one of those two things as they build Power Apps. And then finally, I would love to have Angus come on and tell us too about how to collaborate and debug an app together with the real-time monitor. That's pretty slick technology right there. And I met Angus down at Ignite. Uh, I think I'll reach out to him and see if he can show us that. And then final one, the tabular data stream protocol for CDS. So what is this? Essentially in a nutshell, what this is is a way to get data out from CDS for reporting applications when you need a ton of data real quick. It es essentially enables big data reporting on top of CDS. And in that blog post, when I read it, I didn't know that Chuck had a video on it, but he actually does. It got added to the blog a couple of days after I read it. So I encourage you to go check it out there because he's got a demo where he walks you through it and actually shows it happening live. As always, we like to say thanks to everybody who's part of this community. Uh, these are the folks who are tweeting with the Power Apps CC hashtag this month. It's a great way to connect with everybody who jumps onto the call or just monitor what's going in the community by following that. So thanks to all these folks here who contributed something to the community and tagged it up with Power Apps CC. If you'd like to join the Power Apps call as a presenter sometime and show off something you've done, hit us up on this hashtag and let us know. We're always looking to see what people are doing and help other people learn from it in the community. Two last ways to learn more about Power Apps. This first one is called the Power Addicts Hangout. The next one, I reached out to Vivek. This one happens on July 14. And so this is another group of folks just like in this call, many of us are in that call too. And basically, people get together, chat about Power Apps, show off what they're doing, help each other figure it out. So that's another great place to go. Finally, Donna and Sarah have this great series of Less Code, More Power video series where they interview people from around the world and, again, sharing what they've learned on Power Apps and how to do cool things with it. So you can check this one out at your leisure on demand right there on YouTube. So that brings us to the end of our call today. Thank you. Thank you to everybody who showed up to present and share all your expertise with us. Thanks for everybody in the chat room answering questions, asking questions. Uh, and thanks to everybody who helped Lauren out to make sure that all those kids get home the way they should every time. We will have this recording available soon on the Microsoft 365 Developer channel on YouTube. You can also follow on Twitter, Microsoft 365 Dev, where you'll find a link to the channel that's posted and where we also advertise the call. Thanks again for being here, and we will see you all next week, or next month, I should say, on July 15. Take care. Thanks, guys.